I have to say, I feel like a rock star. This is amazing. Wow, so many wonderful humans out there. Not so uh, skeptical now, are we, about psychology? Love life and enjoy every moment. My name's Julie McCrossan and uh, it is a, a, actually I feel like it's an honour, I don't want to put you on a pedestal, but it is an honour and a pleasure uh, to ask you to welcome Rosie Batty to the stage. And Rosie, of course, as, as, as probably everyone will know, was Australian of the Year in 2015. Uh, and uh, her, her coming into the life of the Australian community was based on the tragic murder of her son, Luke, uh, by her, uh, the father of Luke. And we've been asked to talk about making a difference in the face of great loss. You know, I guess I want to begin, if I may, by just saying thank you for the work you've been doing uh, for women and children in this country to protect them from domestic violence. And we will spend some of our time together he hearing about uh, Rosie's current focus on primary prevention. But first I just want to say to you, you've had the biggest tragedy, you know. It, it, we don't score it, but you've had a big one. But tragedy doesn't have to ruin our lives. You believe that. Can you explain why you say that? Well, I think that um, when you see people on television and they've experienced horrific um, tragedy, you know, it can be most of a family wiped out with a car accident or it can be a child um, terminally ill. And you see this on television every day and you think, how on earth can that family cope how on earth can you ever recover? And I think it's different for everybody, but I do believe we have enormous strength within us. And I would have thought I would have been one of those same people. And I think that... Meaning that you thought you would just collapse? That I would just collapse. And I, I think that... Um, I, I, you know, I've been asked that question a lot. How, how did I, be, how was I able to do what I was able to do? And all I can reflect is that when I was six, I lost my mum suddenly, tragically, and I, I knew, I think my body was familiar with how to cope or how to survive, and I think that it just somehow took me to that familiar part of myself. And so um, I, I do feel that, you know, what happens at that critical moment, um, you know, what you have done throughout your life journey equips you to deal with things possibly at that worst, worst moment in time. Could, could you tell me a little bit more about what you mean that your body knew what to do and, and, and could you bring in your heart and your soul or yeah. spirit as well? Well, I think that, you know, none of us go through life without any kind of grief or trauma. I do think um, trauma is something that most of us will experience at some point. You know, trauma through, um, you know, a number of different, different things. And so I think that um, my journey, moving to Australia, being away from family, um, away from where at my home of birth, um, adapting and settling into a foreign country and establishing myself has often been, you know, significant periods of homeless sickness um, and, and isolation and, um, and, you know, failed jobs and careers where I've really had to assess myself and, and feel, you know, that I've failed or I've had to rebuild and reflect and so I think that all of these disappointments, enormous disappointments, um, and how you pull back from those places of utter despair or despondency or complete feeling of failure, um, it, it's a difficult, difficult You're kind of building space. up muscles that, that prepare you for the, for the next event yeah. that life will hurl at you. And you know, I, you hear a lot about the word resilience now, and the word resilience, I, I, I'm again very familiar with that as a conversation. And I think that, you know, resilience takes practice. It's not something that you have overnight. And I, you know, I consider as, you know, as parents, how much we 
assist our children and the part that we play in a healthy balance of being very protective parents, but how to, you know, how will a child learn resilience if we're protecting them from all disappointment and feeling? So I think that, um, you know, resilience is something that I learnt, I'm sure, from my stoic and lovely grandmother who lived till she was 100 and through again, through those really influential um, people in my life that I loved um, and still my father. And um, so I think that, you know, I've had resilience and stoicism and strength modelled to me from as, as far back as I can remember. One of the things we've been asked to talk about is this notion of, of making a difference. And I, I want to ask Rosie to reflect on, she, you, you were obviously drawn into this massive media maelstrom of opportunity, mm. but also challenge in terms of advocacy for women and children uh, at risk of domestic violence, threatened by domestic violence. And can you give us a sense of what was positive about that for you in your dealing with mm. the loss of your son, but also what some of the challenges were that you, and where you're up to with that. So I think that, again, everybody is different. And my experience on my journey and what I felt I needed to do for myself is different to, for other people. But I think, you know, people don't know how to talk about grief and they don't know how to face someone who's had significant tragedy and so sometimes people will avoid it sometimes people will say things that are really quite unhelpful but well intended um so for me one of the things i've realized is that you know people perhaps don't think you want to talk about it in actual fact you, you'll talk to anybody you'll talk to anybody and for a period of time perhaps you're vulnerable because you'll talk to anybody and it could be any magazine um, without you being selectively um, able to discern, you know, your messaging or what you're saying. You're just openly talking from the heart at a really raw time. Um, have you really, you know, and, and for me, of course, this was propelled into something I hadn't planned, didn't understand. I just felt driven that I'd seen on the, you know, in the TV people who really make a difference through their journey. And it can be somebody you know, who's dying of lung cancer, who wants people to stop smoking. It can be anything that you think, well, my life needs to count for something. This tragedy needs to inform others so that they can make more informed decisions or not have to go through what I'm going through. And, and was it partly too that you wanted Luke's life to stand for something, that this was an opportunity to make mm. a difference for him? Well, I think that, you know, the point is that you don't know what you're thinking. Um, when you've had something happen like this, you're in shock. And you're coming, and all I can say is you come in and out of awareness. It's kind of like a fog. And so you, I think, you know, there'll be many things that my friends will say I did or said that I don't recall. But I do know that there was a determination for me not to fall into what I felt was kind of like an abyss. And so I, I felt very, you know, again, over my life, I've seen people who I've, I've met been really... A, you know, deeply um, um, respectful of their courage. And I felt driven that for a brief period of time, I could make a difference and that like Luke wouldn't, may not have died in vain. But I had no idea how that, what that really meant. And I had no idea how long that would be. I just felt compelled to speak out from the heart when I was given that opportunity to do so. Could I just say, could we all give Rosie a, a round of applause for having that open-hearted approach at the beginning? <laughs> <laughs> and I guess what I want to explore with you is, is the price that you have paid for that taking that public space or, well, being thrust into it <laughs> and then learning to manage mm. it. But what is the price you've paid and where are you up to in your thinking well, about think, making a difference now? And I think the other thing too is, you know, I had been on a what I would have described as a spiritual journey for about 20 years beforehand. All the books I'd read, the workshops I'd been to, the people who, you know, spiritual conversations. I had my own little toolkit and, and I felt that that kind of kicked in 
potentially. And I was really clear that I wanted to be the better person. I did not want to sink to bitterness, anger, and um, I wanted to be that better person, which is why I've always spoken out in a, in, a, in, in, in a way that I think people really feel that it's disloyal in some way to have forgiveness and they really don't understand what that means and how that reflects. So how I am now, I think, is, is further along the journey of, you know, for the first year or two, you're so compelled and driven probably to escape the pain probably to escape the pain, distract yourself in any way that you can, although you maybe you don't want to listen to people advising you against that. Um, when people would say to me, I think you need to take time to grieve, I'd think, I'm grieving every day. Nobody sits at home with me to see the waves of grief coming over me. Um, but I would rather be active than isolated and alone and feeling the depths of despair take over. So I feel really lucky that I've had the skills that I could draw from to speak out because a lot of people either have lost that or know that that wouldn't be the right thing for them to be able to do, they haven't got those skills. And other people are just really still in a very unsafe situation who can never speak out. So I think that, you know, I've been through my journey, um, I've continued to build, I think, on those strengths, and I've had amazing support. So I don't regret that. But, but it is true, isn't it, that you're at a turning point now where you're thinking about boundaries to protect yourself and look after yourself. Could you talk yeah. a little about that? So I think you, you, know, you do what is authentically right in the way that you feel is right for you. And so to be able to travel the length and breadth of Australia, to really try to change the discourse, raise the awareness that one in three women will experience physical violence, one in four children, and one woman a week is being murdered. And every moment I get, I say those statistics because we still need to really deeply understand what a prevalent problem this is. But, you know, attitudinal change, raising awareness, shifting a discourse is a monumental challenge and there's not just myself there's many people who've been working in the family violence sector and for women for decades and it's easy to think that we don't change or we don't we're not making headway but I know we are and I feel that you know when you look at how exhausting this is and when I see another woman murdered and I just or other children that have been murdered you feel sickened again and you feel, but I guess for me right now, it's about looking at um, my own limitations. And I think for four years, I've been driven reacting to Luke's death in the best way I possibly can. But I now have reached the point where I need to look at what's next for me and I think that I need to find some kind of balance where I actually have some joy in my life. Um, I do look at my self-care, and I always have, but I now make more time for that. So, you know, I used to have a bucket list of things I would like to do, and that involves a lot of walking around the world. So last year I went on a, a trek from one, the west coast of England to the east coast of England, which I find for me is, you know, I'm physic I had gained a lot of weight. I had never been overweight before. I have never been so unfit before. I, through mild pneumonia, I got some asthma, and, and I'm, I hate the fact I've got asthma. I don't even like the, to admit that I have asthma. But um, I'm mindful, I'm 56 years old, and there is, there is a lot of the world for me to see, and I make time to, now travel to different countries and make sure I've got some things that you know I want in my life. And because uh, uh, we were discussing briefly fame, and you had fame thrust upon you in the most awful circumstances. It's a it's a tricky beast, isn't it? Give us a sense of what it's like for a lot of people to want a piece of you. Well, I still find it very uncomfortable dis described as famous because as much as anything I say, I'm a well-recognized person for 
you know, the tragic celebrity. It's a really difficult um, cloak to wear. And when initially, you know, I could be on the project and I would come up to, the, um, to, to talk and you can see the respect, but they don't know what to say. And com comedian, you know, comedians don't know how to have a joke around me. And I think, you know, I like a laugh like the best of them. And um, so it's quite an unusual place to find myself. But, you know, what's good is you've got your lifetime friends, your core of people around you that certainly are not frightened of, your, of who you now are. Um, but the hardest thing is, I, you know, was, was that dread of, of pity of, of people not knowing, they not wanting to upset me or not knowing what to say to me. Whereas now I can be out in public and a lot of people probably recognize me but never say anything and I'm, I'm oblivious. And then I've got other people that will very kindly, very respectfully and, you know, come and say um, really beautiful things to me, which to be honest, really lifts my spirits. And I think, well, if people are good enough to say those positive things to me, um, I, can't, I, I embrace it. And, you know, but yes, I come from an English family that didn't hug and we really, you know, loved each other but never said the word I love you, never cuddled or embraced. So now I have people hugging me. Um, and and I've, I think I'm a, become a kind of almost a good hugger but I still find it hard I still find it hard to be the initiator of a hug but I'm embraced and and I think that um we, we love yeah. but it is it, it, could I just have your watch for a second if you wouldn't mind giving it to me um uh, we laugh but I, as someone who for a period of time had a high profile because of uh, television it is odd to be hugged by strangers all the time isn't it uh, but look I want to ask you about your relationship with Luke, mm. you, you know, because he's still with you, isn't he? What, how does trauma and loss change over time? And where are you up to in your relationship with your son and your mother? Yeah, well, my mother, um, you know, it's what, 50 years. I can still cry about it. Yeah. Sorry, because it's... Well, when you ask me questions like that, you're going to get emotions because that's what, you know, that's what happens. So, and the, that, is, that should be okay, right? Um, and that's the thing about grief. When people ask you questions, it doesn't matter if there are tears in response because it's not to feel uncomfortable. It's about real conversations. And so, you know, my mother and her, the loss of her defined the rest of my life. I was six, my brother was four, and my youngest brother was a year old. None of us have married and had successful long-term relationships. So, you know, it, it really does, and that was the tragedy of a, 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 you know, a death of a primary carer. People will say, and I think it comes back to your spiritual belief system, you know, and I've struggled since Luke's death. And I think because I've kept incredibly busy, perhaps some, you know, a lot of people would say, you know, desperately busy, so that I haven't got a moment to really feel too much, which, um, so I'm not sure how much I'm aware of Luke being around me. Other people have a real sense of that spirit. I, I am scared about letting myself, um, you know, really know that. And, and, and there's a lot of me that I don't, you know, I, I miss him so much. It's hard to go there. So, you know, around the house, I have the same photos that I've had since the beginning, but I don't go looking for extra different, you know, I haven't unpacked the photo albums yet. I haven't been through all the videos. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but the Facebook memories, I think, oh my gosh, you know, they come and hit me in the face and, and then I look at them and I kind of try to embrace them now, but they, they are really quite shocking when you're not expecting them. So I think that, you know, I, I think that it, my journey challenges my relationships with those that have known me for some time, that knew Luke. Um, you know, they want to, to fix it for me. They want my life to, they wish they could do something more. And, you know, and fitting with my ebbs and flows and different kind of emotions. Um, you know, some days I'm really embracing life and I'm really thankful for 
opportunities that are coming um, to me and the opportunity to do some things that are really different um, and, my, and, and keep me active and earning an income and, 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 and meeting a really not just intelligent, smart people, but kind, passionate, committed people who are going to, in this world, make change. I'm part of, you know, I feel really privileged to, to meet and, and be part of that. Um, so I think that where I am now is looking at, well, who am I? Because, you know, that person who has always struggled with self-doubt, um, that person who, you know, in the year of being Australian of the Year, I even wrote a book and I, I propelled myself through so much self-doubt and just adrenaline charged. And there was a book I read many, many years ago that said, feel the fear and do it anyway. And I felt that that's my principles about life. You feel really uncomfortable, you're really fearful of failure or whether you're good enough, but just push through that. And so that was where I was propelled. And now I'm actually in a space where I'm, um, I'm nervous. Yeah, well, I, I feel that you're in a space where you're beginning to dare to slow down. And, mm. and you know, I think you just said you've got to feel the fear and, and go forward. Yeah. I, is so your challenge now slowing mm -hmm. down and, and finding a new home? So I've been slowing down for at least a year or so. And you're right that when you do slow down, you have more space and time to be alone, for your thoughts to come in, for the feelings to surface. And it can be really unpleasant and really uncomfortable. And so I've, I, you know, I, every day I, when I can, I try to take long walks on the local beach with my dogs. My dogs are my joy. They live my spirits. What sort are they? I've got a motley crew. I've got um, a failed seeing eye dog called Nelson. And I've got a black lab cross and a schnauzer that was in a puppy farm, five years in a cage. I still can't stroke him. <laughs> He's a, a delightful child. Um, He's a delightful dog. And I think that... Um, I've always lived on a, I lived on a farm when I was a kid. Animals have always been a huge part of my life. And I think that through the trauma I experienced as a child and abandonment, I think animals have been a really safe, um, safe to have around me. Um, they, they never leave you. Unfortunately, their lifespans are shorter, but they, they're always loyal. Um, you can always depend on them, and I think that they've just always given me so much more than I, you know, than any, a lot of humans do. Could I ask you one more thing, and that is, you mentioned the big walk across Britain, mm. and you mentioned daily walking, and of course, pilgrimages and yeah. walking are as, they go way back, we're talking BC yeah. here. What, what is it about the big walk and walking across Britain? Well, how did it help you in a deep way? Well, I've, and I've trekked in um, Nepal and other places too. I think it's being in the moment where you're really in nature, in stunning scenery, and it's, you know, quintessentially um, unique to that country where you are. And you, you're taking that time to, to prioritise yourself. And you, you know, I've been, always been with like-minded people and you're spending that quality time rich conversations, many gin and tonics in the pub, <laughs> and, and good British, well, there is some good British food. <laughs> I promise. Um, not black pudding. But, um, you know, I think that it's about taking that time and really appreciating beautiful scenery and the unique space you're walking through. And challenging yourself physically, you know, every day. Thank goodness for poles. I'm not sure, but uh, you know, nowadays I'm old enough to. I don't think you have to be that old. I, you know, have my poles, and that helps me drag myself along when I'm feeling, you know, um, really physically challenged. But I think it's the physical challenge as well. You mentioned the abyss before. You know, you were mm. avoiding the abyss. What's been you know, one or two key things right now that keep you out of that abyss? Go-to people, 
Um, I don't think one particular friend has is, is able to help you in all areas of your life. I think you've got different friends and, and colleagues and trusted people that you can turn to um, that have your back, that no matter what. Um, you know, I went with trauma. I would suggest that when I became Australian of the Year, I was struggling with post-traumatic stress disorder for a solid two years. I think I was triggered in and out of fight and flight and, and PTSD for nearly two years, which is very difficult for people to be around you when you, they don't understand your anger or this, these, these emotions you can't control. And I think that um, you feel a lot of remorse and, and self-loathing even that you are behaving in ways that are hurting those who are close and around you. And, you know, I look back now and I can see that um, that doesn't happen anymore to me. And the importance, again, of that self-care, where I, I can feel I have a tendency to take on too many things because there's so much needs to change, there's so much I need to do. Um, it's hard to say no. So I have to, and my doctor told me, you know, six years ago, way before Luke was killed, you've got to learn to say no more. And so it's hard when you want to please people, when you, you want to genuinely help, or when you can see the merit of, of what you're being asked to assist with. But when you are utterly exhausted and overwhelmed and you can feel that stress and anxiety kick in, um, I haven't got all the answers about anxiety. I think that, it, you know, for me, and I can see it in other people, um, anxiety is really quick to manifest. And I think that now having more space and time, I start to see it and feel it. And I've got a much greater success in recognizing it and saying, your anxiety is creeping in here and being able to adjust in that in the moment. Whereas, you know, a year or six months ago, I couldn't do that. So I think it's listening and learning all those things that are manifesting that so many people may not go around wearing a badge or may not openly want people to know, but you know, these are normal uh, everyday conditions for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And I think that, again, depression is not comfortable, but it's a necessary part of feeling and it helps us assess what is, you know, what is not working for us in our life or what is that pain and why are we feeling it and developing strategies and ways of shifting and working through that. And I've learned a lot about grief. You know, grief comes in waves and um, it's about greeting it almost like an old friend and knowing it's not going to kill me as such. And people will, you know, one of the worst things that people would say to me is, you'll never get over this. And I would think, I don't want to feel like this for the rest of my life. I couldn't bear to feel like this for the rest of my life. And if these people are telling me you will never get over it, it, it creates a feeling of doom. And I think that what I've learned is that, and I've talked to people who, you know, a lovely woman in Perth, she had her two children murdered um, and she survived. And that's 25 years ago. And she does a lot of really positive work. And, you know, you do, I, I feel that, you know, you, you live with and learn to live with in the best ways that work for you. And that's, I guess, my journey now is how do I honor Luke's memory, um, live with him, but leave behind the worst thing that has happened. and and move forward into a new life for myself and believe that I'm worthy of it, deserving of it, and that there is one there for me. I know we're faceless strangers to a degree, but we feel we know this woman, and I believe there's some authenticity to that. And I ask you to thank her for talking to us so openly today. Thank you. Thank you.